Hillside, Illinois, just west of Chicago. We are at the Queen of Heaven Catholic Cemetery. And we are looking today for Ron Scharf. We're in. This uh, Queen of Heaven Cemetery is right next door to another cemetery called Mount Carmel here in Hillside, Illinois. It's about uh, 20 miles west of the city. And um, it just so happens that a lot of notorious American Chicago-based mobsters operated and are buried at this cemetery. And it's probably by coincidence because the guy we're looking for, Ron Scharf, I don't believe he was in the, uh, the mafia, but ironically, he was killed he was killed by uh, a Chicago hitman, but for very personal reasons, which we'll talk about. So Ron owned a bar called, it was in Lakemore, Illinois, called PM Tavern, or PM Club. And uh, it was a favorite spot by a lot of people. And uh, look at this. Alfred Rachel. He fought in Korea. He died in 85 and he is not a face of the forgotten. He is getting taken care of here. So as it turned out, and this gets back to the hole in the wall game, hole in the wall gang that Anthony Spilatro, I was under Spilatro in Vegas, I think it took 40 years, 30, 40 years to solve this case. Uh, but what happened was Ron owned the tavern and uh, apparently the Lur Lurch's ex-wife was in there some night and she was probably drunk and out of control. And uh, uh, evidently Ron had thrown her Ron had thrown her out, and I, I guess she said he grabbed her by the neck. And uh, she called, now this is Lawrence Newman's ex-wife, calls Larry up in Vegas and said, uh, you know, this guy threw me out of the bar and he jerked me around and got him all ticked off. Well. The, the psychopath that Lawrence Newman was, he already was convicted for uh, other murders and got life sentences or crazy sentences and gets out on parole. You just wonder how these parole boards worked in the day. Anyway, we still have a lot of that going on. So he drives out from Vegas uh, and he had, uh, he had to bring somebody back to Chicago uh, a witness for the mob and he drives to the he drives to the bar and he confronts Ron who's sitting in the living room that's attached to the bar it was a, a small living room I guess apartment and he's there with the bartender uh, Patricia Freeman her first night on the job she she completed and what does he do he just shoots he just shoots Ron in the head. I'm sure there was a, there was an exchange. He just shoots him in the head. And then Patricia started screaming, I guess. So what did he do? He shoots her in the head. What a jerk. What a scumbag. Uh, poor Ron and uh, Patricia received another shot to put him out of their misery, I guess. And... Um, he should be right around here, according to my map. Um, so he killed both of them and they just calmly walked back out and uh, went about his business.
I guess the uh, guy that was with him was terrified. He heard the shots. Here it is, Ronald P. Scharf. This is not far from where I live, um, where Ronald was killed. And uh, it was 1981, yep, June 2nd, 1981. And we just, you know, the, nobody ever figured out who did this crime until uh, a, a guy who uh, took immunity, Anthony, Salatro, uh, Sp Anthony Spilatro's uh, guy, Frank Colotta, had to roll over and become a witness because Spilatro was ordered to, uh, by Lombardo, I think it was, to, uh, to, to kill him. And uh, a government uh, guy came to the prison and played him the tape of the planned hit. And uh, what would you do? Just like I would do, you'd turn government witness. Like, heck with those guys. That's how it worked. So he uh, he got immunity for all his his crimes. Frank had killed people, but he uh, he put the killer of Ronald and Patricia. And uh, there's another story I'll maybe I'll include in here. He put them. Uh, he put Larry Newman in prison. He. He shared and made this case. He solved this crime. And hats off to Frank for um, solving this and, and letting people know. And poor Paul and his brother, I think, I forget his name, they had to wait. Frank had told the uh, FBI, told the, the authorities about this in the 80s, early 80s. And they just, they didn't care. Uh, total incompetency by the government or the police and the uh, family had to live with this for uh, decades until uh, Lurch Larry Newman was put in uh, he was convicted and put in prison and he died in prison Stateville I think it was and uh, took all that time to solve it so we're going to, uh, I'm going to see if I can find Patricia's, Patricia Freeman's grave. And uh, that, uh, she is buried up where, near where this happened. I'm down here in Hillside, nowhere close where the crime happened. We'll get uh, some crime scene of the location where the, the tavern was. Okay, we've got this cleaned off. Pretty good for Ron. So, Ron, you didn't deserve this. You were a young guy. You were doing great things for the community. You're a great father, and uh, I hope you're resting in peace. This is the site. This is the location of where Ron Scharf and Patricia Freeman were murdered by Lawrence Newman from the Chicago Outfit. This was the PM Tavern. This was the PM Tavern. It's been torn down since, but this is the location. Now the bar had a uh, the bar had a uh, apartment that was connected to it and Ron and Patricia were found seated in the upright position on the sofa with two bullet holes in each of their heads. And the police investigation was done by a local 
you know, the, the town sheriff. And in those days, uh, well, this was 81. It's not that old days. But very small town. He kept all the information in his head. No real police records. Sounds like a lot of bumbling because nothing, nothing really happened. And to come to find out that in the recent times, Frank Collado from the uh, Spilatro gang, he was his number one guy with his own crew. He was a made man out there in Las Vegas when all the skimming and all of that was going on. One of his men came back here to get Ron, to get even with him for supposedly choking his wife and throwing her out of the bar. And you got to believe Larry Newman's wife was probably not very respectable to begin with. Now that's speculation, but you, yeah, you, you look at a guy like Ron, which he had a pretty, pretty good, solid guy, family guy worked with the community for him to do that she must have really been a piece of work and then for her to call larry knowing the psychopath that he is she had to imagine that larry was going to come get this guy well you know as far as i'm concerned whoever she is she's she's as guilty and uh a low life as much a low life as uh, her ex-husband, Lurch. When police interviewed Deborah, she tried to turn the tables. She claimed that Ron Scharf had sexually assaulted her. And uh, interesting that right after that, another man that she had told about the assault, well, he didn't recall anything about that. She didn't say anything. There's really no doubt that Deborah Newman was probably a pathological liar and thus uh, a pretty nasty instigator in all of this and she's really got to take the burden a lot of the burden for this terrible crime she's responsible for this mor these two murders she, she didn't have to do that she knew what was going to happen so anyway this is this is where it happened we're in Lakemore, Illinois, by Lilymore Lake. I am now in McHenry, Illinois, and this is the Woodland Cemetery. And we are looking for Patricia Freeman. I do have a general idea of where she is in the cemetery, so uh, let's hope we can find her. She was one of the murder victims with Ron Scharf up at the PM Tavern here. All right, we're in. All right, we have located Patricia's grave right up here. Uh, Patricia was a mother, and she did not even make it to her 33rd birthday uh, she was 32 when she died when she was murdered by that beast Larry Newman she is right over here by between these two trees is very very quiet peaceful cemetery most cemeteries are but I don't know this is it's just really quiet right now. So, Patricia A. Freeman, 1948 to 1981, mother. I don't know, there's not much I can say. Uh, we're telling the story here, but it's just uh, really sad. She was a bartender, finished her first night successfully and uh, 5 a.m. I'm sure they were getting everything closed up, cleaned up, money counted after finishing all the work. Two bullet holes in each of their heads. How do you explain that? How can you even fathom 
a person that would do something like that. It's a beautiful spot. Uh, and I'm sure she's missed. She's, I'm sure she's still missed today. Rest in peace. This is uh, Thomas Michael Sirlock. He was uh, 16 years old when he died in an automobile crash right around here. And uh, he was driving a Chrysler Sebring. I don't know if that's a smaller car, but uh, he was taking a left turn and three people in a Lumina hit him. And um, he died, he was pronounced dead at the hospital, Thomas was. It's another sad case of a child dying early. And uh, I'll tell you this, guys, listen carefully. I truly believe that uh, I'm going to look at what kind of car that was he was in. I'm guessing it's a smaller car, and I'm not a fan of... Uh, your kids start driving. I mean, I'm not saying put them in a giant SUV or a truck, but we lost our daughter because she was driving in what I call a box car. A little, I don't know what it was. It had airbags, but it was a little crappy compact. And she did not survive the head-on collision. And let me tell you, I know kids start driving they shouldn't be in fancy cars, but uh, protect your kids. Put them in a put them in a car that has some beef, so that if if and when they ever would get hit, they've got some mass and protection to absorb. Because these little stupid cars, I think, uh, well. You know what I think. Rest in peace, Thomas. Rest in peace. Austin. Little Austin Michael Mueller. December 28th, 1995 to January 25th, 2000. It says, our, our little lover boy. You know, every family has their special sayings and attributes and nicknames and they all emanate from a child. All these things we say and within our families. Rest in peace, Austin.